In 1955, a nearly suicidal 65-year-old Colonel Sanders moved to Shelbyville, Kentucky, hoping to succeed. After numerous failed attempts to build a successful chicken restaurant, he was left with no other option but to approach restaurants pleading to sell his secret recipe for four cents in profits. But instead, he was turned down 1,009 times. As luck fell on his side on his next attempt, Colonel Sanders would create the world's largest fast food fried chicken franchise and the tastiest chicken recipe the world has ever tasted. This is the story of how a retired colonel became the icon of the fried chicken industry. Colonel Harlan Sanders was born on a small farm in Henryville, Indiana, to Wilbur, David, and Margaret Ann on the 9th of September, 1890. His parents were farmers who owned a large acre of farmland but could barely make enough money to care for their children. As though life couldn't get any harder, Wilbur broke his leg in a fall, causing him to stop his farming activities and to sustain the family, he decided to become a butcher. Unfortunately, Wilbur developed a fever and could barely work anymore. It was later discovered that his fever wasn't just any normal fever, but deadly hay fever. In 1895, Wilbur died, causing Sanders to assume the responsibility of a caregiver of the family at such an early age of five. After the death of Wilbur, Sanders' mother, Margaret, was left penniless and in abject poverty. And to take care of her three children, she went far and near looking for a job. As luck would have it, she got a job at a local tomato canning factory and sometimes worked as a seamstress for nearby families. But she was mostly away from home due to the nature of her job. Sanders, the eldest child of his parents, was forced to take care of his two younger siblings. And to help her pursuit, his mother taught him how to cook at age seven. Sanders was a natural with bread and vegetables as he was responsible for cooking for his siblings when his mother was away at her local tomato canning factory or seamstress job. Sanders decided to look for a job to assist his mother, and at age 10, he got his first job as a farmhand at a local farm in 1900. Margaret decided remarrying was the best idea for the family as she could no longer bear the burden of caring for the children alone. In 1902, Margaret remarried, causing them to move to her new husband's home in the suburbs outside of Indianapolis. Unfortunately, her new husband wasn't keen on having stepchildren, hence he wasn't kind to Sanders or his siblings, causing a strained relationship between him and Sanders. Eventually, Sanders left home for Clark County, where the family first lived, to escape from his stepfather and search for greener pastures. However, his journey for greener pastures would turn out to be a long, thriving one filled with many uncertainties. In 1902, Sanders worked at a farm in Greenwood, Indiana, after he had left home. He was paid a monthly salary of $10 to $15 and offered a room to stay in. Sanders had to shuffle between work and school as he needed to feed the animals early in the morning before going to school. And after completing the sixth grade, Sanders dropped out of school at 16. Sanders, however, claimed in his autobiography that it was due to the difficulty of algebra that he dropped out. He said, algebra's what drove me off. After quitting school in 1906, Sanders asked his mother for permission to live with his uncle in New Albany, Indiana, to which she agreed. At the time, his uncle worked at a streetcar company and aided in securing a conductor job for Sanders. Sanders worked as a streetcar conductor for some months before he decided to join the U.S. Army. However, he was too young for the age requirement, so he falsified his age and enlisted in the Army. He was positioned in Cuba, where he served for some months until he was honorably discharged after completing the mission in February 1907. After his discharge, he would go on to experience several career paths in search of success. Sanders moved to Sheffield, Alabama to live with an uncle who worked for the Southern Railroad. His uncle secured him a job at his company as a blacksmith's helper in the workshops. Sanders worked this job for two months effortlessly, but the pay wasn't good enough. So he moved to Jasper, Alabama to work as a train ash pan cleaner for the Northern Alabama Railroad. He would also go on to work as a steam engine fireman, where he stoked the fire and managed the steam for almost three years. However, he was fired for insubordination after falling ill. In 1908, Sanders started working as a laborer with the Norfolk and Western Railway. During this period, he met Josephine King in Jasper, Alabama. Josephine was a homegirl whose father was a merchant in town. 
She was daddy's precious little girl, who was neither attending school nor teaching, nor did she have any cooking knowledge. Her first cooking lessons came from Sanders, who criticized everything she did in the kitchen. Sanders said, Her family had always hired cooks. She used to say she'd never marry another man who knew how to cook. She meant I criticized everything she did. Sanders fell in love with Josephine and they married shortly afterward. Sanders and Josephine would go on to have three children. After his wedding to Josephine, Sanders left his job and worked as a fireman on the Illinois Central Railroad after moving to Jackson, Tennessee with his wife. While working as a fireman in the daytime, Sanders studied law at the LaSalle Extension University at night. Unfortunately, Sanders lost his job as a fireman after fighting with a colleague. His wife, Josephine, wasn't happy about his inability to keep a job as they could barely take care of the children, so she left with the kids and went back to her parents' house. After some years, Sanders began practicing law in Little Rock. He had hoped being a lawyer would be his pathway to success. Sanders was good at the profession and, surprisingly, had kept his job for three years. At the time, the law profession could have been his pathway to success as he had gained a good reputation and made enough money to bring his wife back home. Unluckily for him, he would once again experience failure in his pathway as he was involved in a courtroom brawl with his client, causing him to lose his job and tarnish his reputation. After the incident, Sanders had no choice but to leave Tennessee and move back to Henryville to live with his mother. Moving back to Henryville was a hit on Sanders, who thought he would have achieved a better life at that age. Unfortunately, his temper was not in agreement with his goals. However, Sanders would go on to start all over again determined, like never before, to succeed. He decided to work as a laborer on the Pennsylvania Railroad. In 1916, Sanders and his family moved to Jeffersonville, where Sanders took a job as an insurance salesman for the Prudential Life Insurance Company, in which he was fired for insubordination. He then moved to Louisville, where he got another insurance salesman job with Mutual Benefit Life of New Jersey. At a time when the ferry boats business was booming, and those who operated this industry became the wealthiest people in the city, Sanders then opened his ferry boat company in 1920, which operated on the Ohio River between Jeffersonville and Louisville. He, however, needed funding, so he sold the majority of the shares of the company, leaving just a minority holding to himself, and was later appointed the secretary of the company. His ferry business became successful overnight, and Sanders took a job as a secretary of the Chambers of Commerce in Columbus, Indiana, to make more money. However, he was not good at the job, so he resigned after some months. Moving on to a different pathway, Sanders decided to sell his ferry boat company shares for $22,000 and use the money to start up an acetylene lamps manufacturing company, a venture he thought would lead him to his peak of success. Regrettably, it was an epic failure after Delco introduced its electric lamp, which it sold on credit. So Sanders moved to Winchester, Kentucky to work as a salesman with the Michelin Tire Company. However, he lost his job in 1924 after the company closed its manufacturing plant. In the same year, he was lucky to meet the general manager of Standard Oil of Kentucky, who offered him a job to run a service station in Nicholasville. Sanders ran the service station for six years successfully before the Great Depression affected the station, causing it to close down and leaving him jobless. Yet again, another unfortunate turn of event. Sanders Court and Cafe In 1930, at 40, a jobless Sanders was frustrated and in dire need of a job. Luck shone on him as he was offered a service station in North Corbin, Kentucky, by Shell Oil Company in return for percentage of sales as payment to the company. While working the job, he took up his longtime hobby of cooking as he started cooking from his living quarters, where he served customers at the back of the service station. In 1937, he decided it was time to open his restaurant, Sanders Court and Cafe, which seated about 142 people. During this period, he was involved in a shootout incident which, although could have led to his abrupt death or jail conviction, worked out in his favor as it eliminated his main local competitor, Matt Stewart. Stewart had shot and killed a Shell employee who worked with Sanders and was later convicted of murder. In 1935, due to the popularity of Sanders Cafe, gas station, and the motel, the Kentucky governor, Ruby Lafoon, commissioned Sanders as a Kentucky colonel. And, as his local popularity and culinary skills grew more and more, a food critic, Duncan Hines, visited Sanders Court and Cafe restaurant in 1939. 
He was amazed by the food and wrote about it in his journal, Adventures and Good Eating. His guide to restaurants throughout the U.S. He wrote, "A very good place to stop en route to Cumberland Falls and the Great Smokies. Continuous 24-hour service, sizzling steaks, fried chicken, country ham, hot biscuits." That same year in July, Sanders bought a motel in Asheville, North Carolina, and in November he experienced another unfortunate setback as Sanders Court and Cafe burnt down. On the 4th of July, 1940, Sanders reopened his newly built Sanders Court and Cafe with an addition of a motel complex adjacent to the restaurant, where he persuaded customers to spend the night at the motel. His motel and restaurant business continued to boom. As it was located along the main north-south route through central Kentucky, Sanders had also mastered his secret recipe for cooking chicken in a pressure fryer, which cooked the meat more quickly than pan fry. In 1941, gas became scarce as the United States entered World War II, and as tourism dwindled, Sanders was compelled to shut down his Asheville motel. Unable to find fulfillment as he could not establish his restaurant chain. Sanders left his mistress Claudia Ludington Price to manage the Sanders Court and Cafe in North Corbin in 1942, while he worked as a supervisor in Seattle, ran cafeterias for the government at an ordnance works in Tennessee, and worked as an assistant cafeteria manager in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, respectively. In 1947, Sanders sold his Asheville motel as it was no longer operational, and eventually, in 1949, he divorced his estranged wife Josephine. As her marriage was unhappy and rocky, that same year he got his long-desired wish of marrying his mistress Claudia. The following year, he was recommissioned as a Kentucky Colonel by Governor Lawrence Weatherby. To live up to his honorary title, he looked and acted the part by imitating the Southern colonels by growing beards and wearing a white or black frock suit and string tie. But yet, at age 60. Sanders still felt like a failure, as the only thing he had successfully achieved was his honorary title, as he was yet to establish a successful restaurant chain. Little did he know what was coming next. In 1952, while looking for ways to grow his restaurant, Sanders had an idea to franchise his secret recipe: Kentucky Fried Chicken. Things took a better turn for Sanders as he signed his first franchise deal with Pete Harmon of South Salt Lake, Utah. Which operated one of the city's largest restaurants. Pete's restaurant sales tripled in just the first year of selling fried chicken using Sanders' secret recipe. In 1956, Sanders experienced another unfortunate event as a new interstate highway was commissioned, which bypassed the service station and reduced customer traffic, causing Sanders to sell up and retire. At 65 years old, he was again broke, with only his savings and 105 U.S. dollars a month from Social Security. At this point, Sanders felt frustrated, and he was ready to give up on his pursuit of success and the life. He decided to kill himself. While attempting to commit suicide, Sanders sat down by a tree to write his will when he had a counterthought, fueled with sadness. Sanders wrote down the things he could have achieved with his life instead of his will. And that was when it hit him that the thing he was good at was cooking. With this, Sanders regained his will to live and decided to give cooking one more chance. In 1959, he moved to Shelbyville, Kentucky, with his wife Claudia, and took a loan of $87 to add to his monthly pension to cook fried chicken using his secret recipe. He then went door to door, pleading with people to franchise with him for four cents in profit, but instead he was turned down repeatedly. After the 1,009th attempt, fortune smiled at him as he started getting potential franchises. His franchise became so successful in the United States that it opened outlets in Canada, the UK, Australia, Mexico, and Jamaica by the mid 1960s. To protect his secret recipe, Sanders obtained a patent and trademarked the phrase "It's finger licking good" in 1963. In 1964. KFC was so successful that it had opened more than 600 franchises in several locations. Sanders, 73 years old at the time, could no longer oversee the company due to his age. He then sold the Kentucky Fried Chicken Corporation for two million dollars to a group of businessmen from Kentucky, led by John Y. Brown Jr. and Jack C. Macy. After successfully achieving his goal, Sanders felt fulfilled. KFC employed him as a brand ambassador with an annual payment of two hundred fifty thousand dollars. He also retained the Canadian franchises and franchising rights in the UK, Florida, 
Utah, and Montana. In 1965, Sanders moved on to start a new beginning in Mississauga, Ontario, a suburb of Toronto. In his new location, he oversaw the Canadian franchises. He occasionally appeared in the United States as Sanders remained the company's symbol even after selling it. He also appeared in many TV commercials and appearances on the company's behalf. In 1968, Sanders and his wife Claudia opened the Claudia Sanders Restaurant in Shelbyville, Kentucky, which was renamed The Colonel's Lady. The Colonel's Lady Restaurant served fried chicken using his original secret recipe, and because of this, Highblen, the parent company of KFC, sued Sanders. After settling out of court with Highblen, Sanders sold the Colonel's Lady Restaurant. However, it operates as the Claudia Sanders Dinner House and is the only non-KFC restaurant serving the original authorized fried chicken recipe. Likewise, in 1973, Sanders sued Hyblin for using his image to promote food items. He played no role in its production. In June 1980, Sanders was diagnosed with acute leukemia. In December, he died of pneumonia. Nevertheless, KFC remains one of the tastiest fried chicken restaurants and the world's biggest fast food restaurant chain, with more than 25,000 outlets in more than 145 countries worldwide. So, this is the story of KFC. For more stories on other companies, subscribe to our channel. Also, remember to like and to leave a comment below and to let us know which companies you would like to learn about next. Click on the card on the screen to learn about the next company.